This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Valeria interviews Dr. Randy Nelson, the author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Ladynomics, a woman's prescription for wealth and financial well-being. As one of the nation's most acclaimed pediatricians and financial wellness experts, Dr. Randy B. Nelson, aka Dr. Randy BMD, is also a nationally recognized author, speaker, and consultant. In addition, she is a sought-after media expert regarding children and young adult health issues and financial wellness expert due to her extensive 14-year career as a vice president in investment banking. Dr. Randy meets with professionals one-on-one -on -one and in groups, traveling the country to instruct and provide financial wellness care to those in need. She is known to be authentic, compassionate, and intelligent, who is equipped with knowledge to get professionals on the path to financial wellness. Meet Dr. Randy on drrandybmd.com. Here is the interview with Dr. Randy Nelson. In your own words, who is Dr. Randy Nelson? Hi, I am a birth sports certified pediatrician and financial wellness expert where I provide your Rx to wealth and financial well-being through my coaching programs, my speaking engagements, and my number one best-selling book, Ladynomics, a woman's prescription for wealth and well-being. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? Mm, that's a great question. I think um, I, I find six, whatever goals that I set for myself, and once I achieve them, um, I consider that to be successful. But I, you know, I'm a pretty ambitious person, so you know, I've set a few goals for myself throughout my, you know, throughout my life. But also, you know, being content, happy having fulfilled, you know, fulfilling relationships with my friends and family and, you know, just living out my purpose. You know, if you, if you achieve all of that, then I think you're pretty successful regardless of what your goals are. How do we know when we have found our purpose? I, uh, that's a good, you, you, you really have to pay attention to yourself. A lot of, uh, soul searching, um, Signs can help because sometimes, you know, you're so off the path that you need something or someone to get you back on the path. And I know, uh, you know, prior to being a physician, I worked in investment banking for 14 years. And there were a couple of things that happened that kind of, you know, brought me onto my path, my current path. Um, first, I lost my father in the year 2000. So it changed my perspective on a lot of things. And then I witnessed um, the destruction of September uh, 2001. I, and um, wow, I mean, my building, because I was working for Citigroup at the time, was only five blocks from the trade center. So I saw everything. I witnessed a hole in the building, the buildings collapse, saw people dropping from buildings. So you go through those two, you know, two pretty significant um, events, you really start to evaluate your life and, um, and, and yeah. And, you know, for a whole year, you know, I had people tell me, oh, you, you know, you really should be doing this. This is, you know, this is what your purpose is. Yeah. Some of it was like supernatural <laughs> things. Mm -hmm, <yeah. laughs> and, um, 
conversations I had with, um, you know, friends and family. And then a year later, after experiencing all that in 2002, I decided to embark on um, the road to medicine. And that's how it kind of started. And um, I also wonder if it always takes suffering or some sort of suffering to get to realize these things and go back to our path. Would you say that we can learn from others so it's always fake suffering? Hmm. Um, I think suffering or, I don't think that's necessary all the time, but sometimes, you know, like if life is just so grand and wonderful, you may not do that introspection, but uh, introspection, but when you suffer, like, you know, when I lost my father, that was huge for me. I mean, we were very close. And, you know, it's funny, he, you know, he had a lot of um, medical uh, conditions. He suffered from seizures and, you know, for a good chunk of his adult life, um, he was disabled, uh, you know, and, you know, he was my biggest cheerleader. He always used to say, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a doctor. So I don't know if on this, like on a subconscious level that, um, you know, pushed me into the direction that I am. But um, yeah, sometimes you really need that gut punch. Sometimes you, because I was doing well in investment banking. I was doing well, but I, um, you know, when I finished Citigroup, I was, uh, but I, you know, resigned from Citigroup. I was a vice president and I was really on the track to higher levels within the company. So it's not like I left because I wasn't doing well. I was doing very well, but you get, you know, you get this feeling like, mm, this is not, this is not it. This is not enough. I should be doing more. And um, currently I don't have those feelings because I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. What is to be healthy? What is a healthy person to you? What does it look like? Mm, when I see a healthy person, I, I mean, you see it in various ways, physical health. You know, when I have a patient that come in and I do an exam and I, um, you know, run labs and everything comes in right, the exam is fine, you know, on a behavioral, men you know, and I'm pediatric, so I'm not adult. <laughs> so, but, you know, even with kids, kids suffer trauma, they, you know, Things, a lot of things can you know, happen to them as well. But when I see them and, and, you know, they're doing well in school and they have, um, you know, decent relationship with their family and they, they haven't ventured into, you know, like unsavory behavior. Um, like when, when people are going, when they're in the flow of life, when they just go, like nothing's perfect, you're going to experience things. But when you, you know, if you would get to an obstacle, and you deal with it appropriately, you know, you have the right coping um, mechanisms and you just continue forward, you know, that's what seems healthy. Yeah, being mentally strong. Then we can overcome even physical illnesses and right. diseases. Right, exactly. Yes, because the mental, the mental, if you have behavioral mental issues, it can manifest um, into physical ailments. So it's all connected. What do you think is the purpose of the human experience? Mm, wow. Oh, my goodness. Um, for me, personally, is um, helping others. Like, you know, I don't, we don't live in a vacuum. Everyone starts off, everyone's at different levels. And, you know, someone may be doing, you know, what I consider better than me, you know, maybe financially or whatever. Yeah spiritually um and i can be that 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 someone to someone else yeah. so you know my job is to kind of learn from the people who i admire and you know would love to emulate yeah. and on the flip side bring others up help others who aren't as fortunate as i am um yeah. i think that's you know, I think that's the purpose. I think, you know, we're all interconnected. I, I don't like separate separatism. Um, no one, everyone needs, we, we all need each other. We really do. It's so true. I hear that often, very often, the purpose of life being helping others, that this connectivity, knowing that everything's connected, that we are one big family. Right, we are. <laughs> Not separate. It, that saddens me a lot of times. I try to understand, but it seems like I have given up on that, trying to understand why some people, some human beings still 
judge and see differences as a something that's not good. Right. So I don't understand that. And I often don't question because I gave up on that. I'm trying to understand their minds. <laughs> well, but Diversity to me is just beautiful. Like I love being in um, diverse um, environments and um, being around being around people, even traveling. I love traveling because to different countries because, you know, you're, you're experiencing a different uh, culture. You're seeing a different population of individuals and you can always learn from that. I love it. it that's why I love living in New York because New York City is very diverse. Um, I thrive off of that. I thrive. So yeah, it's, it is disappointing when, um, you know, others don't, appreciate that but it could be due to experience you only know what you know what do you love most about being a woman mm, we are strong <laughs> that's true i agree we are very we are very strong um you know it's, i i just um I, I love our tenacity i love femininity. I love that. Um, you could be strong and feminine at the same time. You know, I mean, this is my definition. Every It's different for everyone else, of course. Um, and um, I just think we're beautiful. I, th I just think we are, you know, we're just beautiful. And, you know, considering how we are sometimes considered second class citizens in the society or the world, you know, we still overcome. We still overcome. Um, I think a lot of institutions do better when women run it <laughs> because we tap into different aspects of ourselves and, um, you know, we're nurturers, not to say that men aren't, but I think naturally we are. And, um, yeah, that's, I think that's what makes us phenomenal. Have you faced any challenges for being a woman? Oh, wow. Yes. I mean, I have, I, I... <laughs> I have two, I have a double obstacle. I'm a woman and I'm a black woman. <laughs> but um, so, um, yeah, and I just, you know, like I said, I'm a very ambitious person. Uh, if I did something that I want to do, I'm going to, you know, I, I do it regardless of what other people think about it or obstacles. I, you know, I've, I've been in two male dominated industries, investment banking and um medicine so yeah i think the obstacles is maybe you know like the obstacles are you know maybe individuals not taking you seriously or doubting your intelligence you know uh, i consider myself to be very intelligent very smart and so when you know people just um disregard that or kind of judge you before knowing you based on your appearance and based on your gender, or your race, then, you know, those, it's, it, you just have to do more. I just found that I had to prove myself more um, throughout my life and my career. That is interesting. I have experienced very similar. I'm not white, I'm brown from Brazil. It's always saddens me. For me, it becomes like sad. Yeah, I think I learned to do that too, to push myself, to try to prove myself. But with that, I also, uh, I noticed other challenges, like trying too hard and uh, resting enough. Right. And, uh, right. Right. Yeah. Taking care right. of ourselves. Taking care of yourself yeah. or just letting, because it's really not your fault. It's the other person's, person's fault. So you internalize that and that's never healthy. That's never good. So build up your confidence and just know that you are just as smart. You're just as brilliant. You're just as bright as any other person, man or woman would you say this is a practice for life yeah you grow into that yeah I, well 20 years ago i, I probably wouldn't say that because <laughs> i was grown in <laughs> 20 30 years starting <laughs> out you know that's what you have to do is just try hard you know play the game you know that kind of thing but you know being older now no i know i know differently this next one is about 2020 this year. We have faced lots of challenges and chains. So my question is, what lessons have you learned from 2020? Oh my goodness. Um, that I feel like 
I don't, I, you know, during when the pandemic, like I worked throughout the whole pandemic, I'm a physician. So, you know, I was in the midst of, not a frontline worker, like some of my colleagues, but I was still seeing patients doing some telehealth. And I just, just realized that, um, I felt like before we were just so busy, even in my life, I felt like we were just so busy, uh, not really, not really um, feeling because we're just going from one thing to the next thing. And one and the one thing the pandemic did is, you know, especially in March and April, when everything was shut down, is that you really had to figure out how to exist without all the noise, you know, um, you you had to deal with feelings that you probably haven't had to access in a long time. Um, you know, and it didn't it didn't matter whether you were home alone most of the time or if you were stuck with family twenty four seven. Um, you really had to adjust and and find different ways of living and coping and adjusting and appreciating. You know. It, like you know, some people say, you know, staying home is such a terrible thing. But if you have a home to to live in and you had a roof over your shoulder, uh, uh, over your head, um, that's gratitude. If you're healthy, gratitude. Um, if you have a family that you're a, you were able to stay with and you know learn, you know maybe maybe life was so busy that you didn't really understand your children or didn't know what was really going on in their lives or your spouse or your significant other, um, you know, 2020 kind of forced you, um, to do those things. And, um, I think one of the lessons I came away with, it was really just understanding what's important in life. What's really, truly, truly, um, important. And, you know, with the pandemic and with the surge of deaths, um, I can't say everyone feels this, but um, I know in New York City, people, um, I, I, you know, you see people caring for one another, you know, um, you know, we have like these food lines, the pantry lines, uh, a lot of folks donating, the ones that have donating and trying to assist others who aren't as fortunate. Um, you know, a lot of my friends, my friends are physicians, we were still working. I know a lot of times we would, you know, just order out so that we can support a small business, not necessarily because we needed to order out, but we wanted to make sure that we can help, you know, one of our, our favorite businesses be sustainable. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of lessons, just a lot <laughs> from this year's been truly, truly, um, truly uh and, yeah just truly um unbelievable <laughs> yeah it was uh, unexpected right all these yes. changes and, yes yes uh, yeah. but uh, yeah i do hope that we are coming back to that deeper understanding of what life is everything's connected that we are here to support one another and hopefully that will be the lesson for all of us yeah i don't know if everyone's getting it but <laughs> true <laughs> yeah that's the lesson yeah what is your understanding and idea of spirituality? Mm, well, I am, you know, I'm a Christian, so I, you know, my relationship with God, who, who's, who's our spiritual um, being, um, is very important to me. I've been that way since I was a young girl. Um, I pray a lot. Uh, I, I I try not to. Um, take things on sometimes because I know there are things that like uh, that's just out of my control so you know I do my prayers and I just leave it and just believe that um, it will be taken care of whatever the situation is um and um I mean that's pretty that's that's and just being in tune with yourself I, I I feel like when you're in tune with yourself you get a lot of the answers that you need and um yeah, I, you know, we're all spiritual beings. We're all souls. <laughs> so the more you tap into that, I, I just feel like it's just better. Life is easier. So how did you become a writer? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. I, you know, I, I've always in some aspect um, 
you know, growing up when I was a young girl, if, if you know, if I wanted to, I, I, it's easy for me to write something that it is for me to express it verbally, believe it or not. Um, so when I was a young girl, I used to write letters to my mother, like, why, you know, why did you do this? Like, why, why? <laughs> it's so funny when I think about it. When I was like 10, 11, I used to do that. Um, and, um, and like after my father died, and I might, I might, turn these words into a book because I have the manuscript but right after my father passed away oh my gosh all I could do was write 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 oh it was just it was I I wrote like 200 pages of just like thoughts and it was just my way of dealing with uh, grief um so writing is very important but in terms of um what I do now uh, you know, being a financial wellness expert, where I kind of bridged my pride, you know, my former life as an investment banking, like accountant professional to now physician, where I concentrate on financial wealth. Uh, I, you know, I love putting together a book that I felt was digestible. I like using that word digestible because finance can be very intimidating. And and many people shy away from it because it's just, you know, it's just, it, it's just very intim- it, it, it is, yeah. it, intimidating. Right. Yeah. So That's a good word. I th- yeah, I thought to um, write a book that was easy to understand. I'm a pediatrician, so I know how to break things down right. to right. simple right. terms because <laughs> right. I talk with children or adolescents. <laughs> Um, a lot. So, and um, yeah, so that's how I, that's how I wrote my first book. Uh, um, Lady Nomics, a woman's prescription for wealth and financial well-being. It's a very easy to read book about uh, financial basics and um, yeah. And I, I, I love it. I love it. I've gotten great reviews on it. And um, you know, I wrote it just to be like almost like a stepping stone so that individuals who have no background on finances can just get the base, like the foundation of it so that when they start getting into these transactions or, you know, maybe it's just a stepping stone, like, okay, well, okay. You talked about mutual funds. Let me go online and see what mutual funds is. Let me see what kind of products they're out there. What more can I learn? I, I really want it to be that, um, like I said, like I said, a stepping stone to take your knowledge to a different level. So true. you use a very powerful word that relates to that. It has been my case, intimidating. I'm wondering why we feel this way about money and finances. Well, a lot of it is due to that, um, you know, the roles that, you know, the roles we have in society. Remember, like even as late as the 1970s, women were not allowed to do their own financial transactions, they needed a man to do that, a man to open up an account, a man to buy uh, financial property. So I think a lot of that stems from that. And, and money is very masculine. It's a very masculine like topic. And um, some women, you know, may feel that it's just not appropriate or they feel like they're not, they don't have the ability or the confidence to discuss it. Uh, uh, there's a statistic that I read some time ago that uh, like 75% of women do not bring up money in a conversation, but 90% of them would love to, but they just don't. Now I've been immune to that because I started my career, like I'm, I'm an accountant. So numbers, figures, is not a big deal for me. And I started my career in investment banking, which is like, as masculine as you can get. If you remember the movies, Wall Street and that, all that kind of stuff, running it. So, um, yeah. Perhaps learning from another woman would be the way yes. to do it. <laughs> it yes, it easier. absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. How did you put this work together? Uh, health and financial wellness. What was the inspiration? Was it a process or a moment in time? It's, I, you know, my mother, I, you know, whenever I talk about this journey, I have to bring my mother into it because she, um, you know, growing up, my parents are, you know, West Indian. They came to this country, of course, to do a better life. And, you know, initially they were doing quite well, doing well. 
you know, um, they're not professionals, but they, you know, had decent jobs and, you know, were able to purchase their first home when they were like maybe late twenties, early thirties. Then my father became ill and um, became disabled. So of course, and millions of families have suffered through this. Things went downhill financially for us because my father could no longer work and my mother worked, but um, she all of a sudden became the breadwinner and had a household for us while my father was trying to deal with his disability. So, um, you know, things changed very quickly for us. And um, so, but I saw the stress that my mother, even though, uh, you know, we eventually like recovered. Um, or triumphed over our initial setback, I saw the stress that my mother went through. I mean, it was tough because for years she didn't have to do that. My father was the head. He took care of everything. And then all of a sudden she was, and she had two kids she had to like raise and provide for. And, um, and I saw the stress that, that, you know, how it affected her. And, you know, now, now fast forward, yeah, we're doing well. My brother and I are doing well. My mother's retired. She retired early. She's always been good with money. Always, 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 always. I mean, that is, she was fabulous with it. Um, and um, so fast forward now, uh, you know, I work with, I'm a pediatrician, but I work with the underserved communities of New York City. And, um, you know, I see children of, you know, mothers, women uh, who are living in domestic shelters, you know, life was doing, you know, life was well, life, they were doing well, they had a job or, you know, maybe they were a housewife and um, their partner was taking care of them. And then all of a sudden something happened and they had to leave and, and um, move into one of these shelters. So because they didn't have access to resources or maybe was taken from them, you know, who knows what the background is. So, you know, my desire is to um, kind of, I feel like with knowledge, especially when it comes to finance, financial knowledge and we're making right decisions in terms of like savings and investing and having a nest egg, um, you know, you could kind of mitigate some of those um, bad things. Because even in my family, like, yes, I had my mother and I saw some of the things she's done, but I have a lot of like um, single moms in my family who were like successful business owners or um, again, did very well with managing their finances that they were able to, you know, buy a home for their families. I mean, like that was, that was also my reality. So there was so much, there was so much. And I just want to, I just want to bring that to the public. I want them to know because look, let me tell you, if you're if mom and dad and if mom, mom and or dad, mom and mom, you know, whoever the rental unit is, if they are stressed out about their finances, the kids feel it. They feel it. They understand it and they worry about it just as much as mom and dad um do. So um and and financial stress can translate or, or manifest into physical ail ailments like gastrointestinal disorders, like ulcers or, um, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, heart condition, diabetes. If, you know, if you, if like say your emotional ear and you, you, you become obese and, you know, that results in type two diabetes, it's just, there's so much, just, it's no different from any other stressors that you have in life. So the more you can learn, the more you can do in that aspect, I think the better. And that's how, I, so that's how, that's the medical side of me and the financial side of me kind of married <laughs> together. It makes so much sense. Yeah. The more mm -hmm. I read about I'm like, wow, how do we know when we need help financially? What are the signs that our financial situation is affecting our health? Mm. Okay. I mean. So financially to know when things are out of control is if um, you're maxed out on credit cards, you're using overdraft a lot. So you have an overdraft account um, connected to your checking account and you find that you are bouncing checks or whatever. Uh, if um, 
you are not paying your bills. <laughs> if you know you, you if you just if you, the money's just not there to pay your bills, or um, you can't cover your basics like your utilities or your rental mortgage, um, you have a difficulty putting gas in your car. If you're at that point, um, you're in trouble. You're you're in financial trouble. Physically, mentally, if you find that you cannot sleep at night or you're anxious or, you know, you're worried about where, the, where food is going to come from, like, your, you know, your next meal or how you're going to, you know, put food in the refrigerator. If you are worried, if you're thinking about that all the time, then you know, um, then you know that there is an issue. There's definitely, and like I said, we see it now with the pandemic. We, we 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 see it now. A lot of families who've never been on pantry lines are asking for help. What happened in this case when we reached that level of financial discomfort per se? What went wrong? What would you say? Lack of education or what? I mean, I mean, there's I mean, there's so many aspects to this. Um, so, um, you know, some people, you know, dependent, some, some individuals don't just make enough money to live. Forget about having a credit card or buying, um, luxury items that they can't afford or charging up things. You know, I, I used to live in an apartment building and, um, you know, one of the workers there, he you know, lived in, it was Brooklyn. And, um, you know, we were just talking, I don't even know how we got into the subject. And he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to have to try and find work in a shelter. I mean, find to live in a shelter for my son and I, because, um, you know, my landlord raised my rent and I can't afford that. So there are plenty of people who live in shelters who, who work full time. It's just that there's no living way. This, you know, they just, they're just not, even with 15, you know, dollar an hour minimum wage, it's just not it's just not enough to live in a city like New York or L.A. or, you know, wherever, Chicago, um, the big cities, the urban cities. Uh, so, you know, people, you know, they can say whatever they want about that. OK, well, maybe they're not educated enough or, um, you know, they should be a professional so that they can afford. I mean, this people I mean, everybody needs to do a job, but everyone should be able to live also. So that's one thing that's, a, I mean, he's stressed out because he can't live in his apartment anymore because his rent has gone up significantly. So he may have to end up in the shelter system. That, that would keep me up at night. <laughs> you know, that would keep me up. Um, and then, you know, some of my um, professional friends or, you know, people I know just growing up or like in my circle, not my circle so much, but that college acquaintances, whatever, it could just be living beyond your means. And it just gets to a point where, you know, um, and where you can't, you know, you, 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 there's no way to kind of get out of it. So, you know, you buy things that uh, you really can't afford, maybe keeping up with the Joneses. You see so-and-so, you know, living in this type of house and buy, driving this type of car, this luxury car. Oh, and because you live in the same neighborhood or because you belong to the same circle of friends, you have to keep up. And then next thing you know, like you're in terrible debt um, and um, and now you're trying to figure your way out of that. So there's various reasons why um, an individual, it could be you could have a catastrophic um, event like um, an illness. Life is going well and then. Um, you have some medical problem and it wipes out your savings or, you know, whatever, and you just find yourself or a job loss. So there's, you know, there's various reasons why um, an individual will end up in some sort of financial calamity. My next question is about strong financial health. What are the signs? How do we know when we are walking this path finally? Mm, yes, um, you have emergency savings. You know, we recommend most financial uh, planners will, it varies with like three to six months, maybe three to eight months of savings. So that should something happen if you have a job loss. So if you have a medical condition um, that's kind of, or a disability, 
you have money to fall back on. I'll never forget the story about a guy. I'm in like a physician group and there was a doctor in it because a lot of doctors um, uh, experienced significant job cuts. I mean, salary cuts in this past. Um, and this one man said, oh, you know, I, I'm taking a 75% salary cut. And we're like, what? <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. I don't care how much money you make. That's a significant <laughs> amount of money. And But he said, I have 12 months of it. I have 12 months of expenses in uh, emergency fund. I was like, wow, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, so I think healthy financial habit would be like the opposite of everything that I talk about, that you don't stress over money. You can um, pay your bills or you're not in debt. Uh, you're not living off of credit cards. Like you bring in enough so that you're to live. You, you are contributing enough to a savings and investing, you're meeting your financial goals. Those are all signs of like financial stress to me, I mean, uh, financial success. You're able to help family members. You're able to provide for your family um, and, and do the things that you enjoy doing without it causing any financial um, problems. Mm. Oh, that living within like... your means, living within your means. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to be out of balance, but then learning, knowing how to go back to balance is very yes, important. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. No one's perfect. Things happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> but having the tools and the knowledge to know mm-hmm. what you, um, what, what, you, where you need to be, and how to get there. This idea of um, planning for the future. How do we balance that? Uh, living in the moment, enjoying life. How do we balance that with planning the future? Yes. I, you know, I, 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 I definitely agree with that. I, you know, I think if you're too frugal to the point where everything's going towards savings, except for maybe your rent and utilities and you're not living life, you, you know, like, I don't think that's healthy, but that's a judgment call that might be what they want. And that's what makes them happy. Fine. For me, that couldn't work. Um, but spending everything that you bring in without putting something aside for um, investing like retirement. I'm, I'm like, retirement is on the horizon for me. I can't spend every single thing that I bring in because I know this is what I want to do. But I know in terms of my happiness, um, like I said, I love to travel. Uh, I'm, I'm going to find a way to do that. What I will do is I know that if I want to travel and save and, you know, try and say for goals or whatever that I have, I might not be able to take like a $2,000 vacation or, you know, something like that. Maybe I have to find deals where I can get a, a you know, a nice package for like seven, $800 or something like that. You'd be creative. You, you know, you'd be creative. If somebody has like timeshare, Hey, maybe ask them if you can use it. So, you know, you find ways to, um, you know, there's always, I feel like there's always a way and I, and that's how I am. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice doing some of the things that I enjoy. I love, um, you know, museums. I get a membership for, you know, $75 a year, as opposed to paying $20 each admission. So that's that. Those are the kind of things that I look forward to. That's what things I employ, tactics I employ. So I guess I have a few more questions for you. We're almost at the end, but there's another one. Um, You have some interesting questions with the self-assessment for financial health. There's one that kind of caught my attention. You talk about retirement. So the question is, are you actively saving for retirement? So my question is, when do we need to think about retirement? What is the age? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, I think once you start hitting, you know, it really depends on what your goal is. Like if you are 20 and you say you want to um, retire at 50, right? There are people like that. They qualify or they're financially independent and they want to stop working. If you want to retire at age 50, you know, you have to start planning like right away, like in your twenties so that you can have, you know, you can have enough money so that you can live out from 50, like uh, life expectancy. It's like in the eighties now, that's 30 years of money that you have to have available to live off of. Um, so, but if you're, if you're like most people and you're saying, um, you know, you want to retire, say like at 60, 65, you really should start putting a plan together like in your thirties. 
Yeah. And, you know, of course, if it, it adjusts and, you know, all of this sounds perfect, <laughs> but when life hits is different because you have family and you have to save for college and all sorts of things. But the key with that, the earlier you, you start, the better, the earlier you start, you can save like a 20 year old can maybe put aside $50 a month and retire would say, I'm, and I'm just throwing out numbers. Like, I don't want anybody to say, oh, that doesn't make any sense. No, what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, you know, I just want you to understand the concept. Uh, a 20 year old can maybe put a hundred dollars a month over a 40 year period and come up with the same money as the person who starts saving at retirement at 40 and is having to need and is having to put a $1,500 a month to get to the same dollar. So, so like, say, you know, your goal is to have a million dollars of retirement. If a 40 year old starts saving for retirement, they may have to put in $1,500 a month to $2,000 a month to get to that goal. If they start at 40, a 20 year old may only have to put in a hundred, two hundred dollars a month to get to that. So the time, you know, it's called, you know, it, the early you, you start, um, you're able to take advantage of what we call compounding, the, the concept of compounding, making money off of money. And you'll be surprised at how you how much you accumulate. So the earlier you start, like I said, those examples are getting very simplistic. I'm just throwing out numbers. But the basic concept is the earlier you start, the better for you. So by 30, you should start doing something. You should start putting some money aside because what happens is the later you start, you may not get to where you want and you may have to work late. Like you may have to continue working until maybe you're, you're 70 or 75. So you should always think about it. Yeah, I agree. Although some people might choose to always work. I have met people who they are in their 70, 75, even 80, they still work. Right, right. Yeah, it depends on your goal. But you know what? I like. I, I, I see myself working, but I don't mm. want to have to. Mm. You don't want to have <laughs> to work. Right? Have to work. Yes. So another question I have is about the last one on the topic is about personal financial health and business financial health. Do we use the same principles, or they are somehow different? Um. It's probably a little different, um, you know, um, personal, you know, the goal, I feel, you know, I feel like the goal of, uh, personal, um, financial health is pretty much, it's, it's, it's really centered on you. You know, you want to be like, the goal is to be like debt free. I mean, you may have a mortgage, but it's collateralized by your house. So not everybody has money to just pay out a house right away. Um, so that's a little different, but you know, the goal is to like have no consumer debt, debt to have savings, um, to have savings, um, you know, the things that we've spoken about business may work a little different. Like, you know, if you start a business, yeah, to, to have debt, to be debt free in a business is fantastic, you know, um, but you may have to take out a business loan to um, get your business started. But, you know, the key is to generate enough revenue so that you can, you know, pay off those loans and 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 not be indebted to like a creditor or lender. The key from what I understand is no debts. That's very important for both. You know, you may in business, you may have to take on some debt to kind of run your business, or yeah. you may have investors, people who invest money into your business, who may be like part owners. So it's, it works a little differently. Like you're not going to have, I mean, you may have personal loans from family members, uh, but um, for the most part, you want to be able to do what you need to do based on the income that you bring in. And in business, you have to spend money to make money. You know, in, in personal finance, that's a little different. You take the money that you have and you use as little, you know, you you use as little to get the, the goal is to um, have money um, at the end of the day so that you can do your, you know, fulfill your financial goals. We're almost at the end. I have a few more questions for you. The final ones before that, would you like to add anything? 
Um, no, I just, um, I just, I just want to say that it's really, again, just stress the importance of, of, um, financial wellness, um, you know, financial wellness in leading a, a less stressful life. I, I just don't, I just wonder how, um, I don't know if a lot of the public or if a lot of people make that connection. I guess uh, you talked about your father and grief. So what lessons have you learned from grief? Oh, oh I mean, you, you, well, in, in my father's situation, um, it propels me onto my purpose. Like, you know, just, and I guess you have to lose someone that you really like, but you hear of stories of, you know, mothers or anyone who, um, or fathers who've lost a child and that propelled them to run for office or to start a, a foundation in, the, you know, their child's name. So sometimes these things, um, propel you to somewhere else. And that's what happened in my situation. And again, the other thing I learned is, you know, just go through the emotions, go through, I mean, we grieved, we're, a lot of us are grieving now, the life that we want to live. Uh, but um, the key is to feel whatever you're feeling and find a different way. It's fine if you're in business, you know, you know, we talked about business, what a lot of people have done that I've seen, they may not have brick and mortar or, you know, they might've sustained some losses one way, but there are people who are thriving on the internet with internet-based businesses. So maybe you can think of, you know, you could pivot and, and do something different for your business. Um, so, there, you know, there's a lesson in everything. There's a lesson, there's a purpose in anything. And grieving, definitely. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I um, no, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe give a little bit more. <laughs> I would probably yeah. donate. Yeah, donate more. Give, give more. If I, if some, if I had a definite date, I would, I would probably do more with charity and, and do more like things, I don't know, with other people. And my last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of today? What I know for sure is yeah. that it's always changing, always. Things have a way of working out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Things have a way of working out and, um, you know, a lot of people may not agree with that, but it, it, you know, it's also your belief system. I, I believe that it, mm. it may not be the way it is right now, but eventually you'll get to where you're supposed to be. So that's two. Um, the third, what do I know for sure? Um, hmm, what's the third one? Um, that is beautiful. <laughs> That is really, it's, it's, it's real. There's beauty in everything. I mean, there's beauty in every, I mean, that's one thing I've noticed. There's beauty, there's beauty in everything. And there's good in everything. As long as you, you as long as you can see it and extract from it. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Randy, for your wisdom, your message, your mission, your beautiful and genuine presence. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So my last question is a technical one. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Thank you. So one of the best things to do is, um, is follow me on all social media at, at Dr. Randy B M D. That's my, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I do have a Black Friday special where I am offering my book, Ladynomics, A Woman's Prescription for Wealth and Financial Wellbeing, um, a t-shirt, and, and a one hour uh, financial strategy session with me for $147. Um, and the, the, you can sign up for that at www ladynomicswealthbundle.com 
and I could spell that out if you'd like. Oh, wonderful. I'll have the link uh, within the okay, podcast. Perfect. Yeah, written. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Ladynomicsworkbundle.com and on my website, um, drrandybmd.com. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Yes, thank you. Bye for now, Dr. Randy. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Dr. Randy Nelson and her work, please visit drrandybmd.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.